Well, good morning and welcome to our service here at Hope Church Leeds. Because it's the first Sunday of the month, as is our pattern, we're going to be celebrating the Lord's death together in communion a little bit later on. So if you want to join in, obviously you need your own bread and wine or juice ready for that. But let's begin by worshipping our God together. Let's sing this great song of praise. Well, Tom's going to lead us in our time of communion in a few moments, but let's just now commit our time to God in prayer. Let's pray. Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we want to thank you that we have this opportunity once again to gather together via the internet to praise and worship you, to seek your face, Lord, and to hear your word. Lord, we do pray that you would help us in this time by your spirit, and even though we're separated physically, may there be a sense of unity and of oneness in Christ. Lord, we pray as we gather around your table in a few moments that you would cause us to be thankful and worship you for all that you have done for us, all that our Saviour, the Lord Jesus, has done for us. And we praise you and worship you for him. We thank you, Lord, for the difference that he's made in our lives. Thank you for the wonderful joy of sins forgiven. Thank you for the wonderful peace that he brings into our hearts. Thank you for the hope that we have, that uh, we know where our future lies and that we're safe and secure for all of eternity. Lord, we do want to commit then our time to you now and ask that you would lead us and guide us by your spirit. May we all sense and know your presence, your touch upon our lives just now. So we commit our time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Well, as we come to a time of communion, we're going to sing a song that's going to just lead us into that time together. Well, good morning, everyone. We're just going to spend a few moments now remembering the Lord's death 
as we celebrate communion. Uh, so if you've not got bread or juice or wine uh, ready, then just pause the video and go get some as we come to look at God's word. I thought I'd just read uh, some verses from Romans chapter 5 uh, to help us remember what the, the Lord has done for us as we celebrate communion. So Romans chapter 5 from verse 6 says this, You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his Son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? I don't know about you, but it can be very easy to, to, to forget what Jesus did for us on the cross, to play it down. It can be very easy to just say things like, God loves me and... Jesus loves me or Jesus died for me and it's easy to say it with without really remembering what that means what truly happened there and that's why we're called to to celebrate communion to remember the Lord's death but to remember God's love for us That verse, verse 8 of Romans chapter 5, is a familiar verse with many, but it's a powerful verse, isn't it? God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Again, it's easy to think of ourselves as good people, as people who deserve God's love. But God showed his love for us whilst we were sinners, whilst we didn't care about God whilst we rejected him, whilst we rebelled against him. It was at that point when Jesus died for us. That's what love is. That sacrificial love, a love that we don't deserve. A love that we, we can't even fully comprehend. And that's what we're to remember as we celebrate communion. It's that love that we are to show to those around us. It's that love that is to motivate us for, to live a godly life, to live a life of service to him. And so we take the bread uh, and the cup this morning in remembrance of that love that he showed us. As a time where we can be thankful, as a time where we can come before him now and bring those things, those sins that perhaps have been hindering us over this past week. We can confess our failures, can confess our weakness and come before the God of love who died for us. And so we take the bread. We know it's a symbol of his body that was broken for us on that cross. Let's take the bread and be thankful as we remember the love of Jesus as he died for us on the cross. I'll just pray for this bread first. Father in heaven, we do thank you so much for the love that you have showed us. Lord, it's a love that we so easily forget, a love that we so easily play down and, and neglect. But Lord, what an amazing love it is. A love that died for us, even whilst we were sinners, whilst we were ungodly, whilst we were your enemy. Lord, we thank you so much for the love of Christ 
at the cross for us. We thank you for his body that was broken for us. Lord, the pain that he went through, the torment, the, the mocking, the insults, Lord, the darkness, as you turned away from him, as he, as he hung on that cross, as he bore the punishment of our sin, the punishment we deserve for us, Lord, we thank you so much for that. We pray that you'd help us to remember that love and that that love would motivate us to live a life of service for you. Lord, we thank you for the cross. In Jesus' name, amen. And Lord, we do thank you for the blood that was shed. Lord, the blood of Jesus, our perfect sacrifice on the cross. Lord, that blood that reconciled us to you, that blood that makes us right with you, Lord, that blood that means we can have a relationship with you, that we can be called children of God. We can be part of your family. Lord, we thank you so much for that. Lord, help us not forget the great sacrifice that it was, the great cost at which it came, the cost of Jesus' life. Lord, we thank you for the blood of Christ that makes us right with you. In Jesus' name, amen. And let's take the cup. As we remember, it's a symbol of Jesus' blood, and let's drink it with thankful hearts. I'll just pray to close. Lord, we thank you for this uh, time of communion. We thank you for this time where we can remember the love that you show to us day by day. Lord, help us to live in light of that love. Help us to live a life that shows love to others, a life motivated by the love of Jesus at the cross. Lord, we pray that you would bless our, the rest of our time this morning in this service. Lord, we pray that you would bless um, the reading of your word and the teaching of your word as it comes to us later on. We pray that it might build us up in our faith. In Jesus' name, Amen.
This week's reading is taken from Philippians chapter 2 and it's verses 1 to 11. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Henry Ford, the great pioneer of motor manufacturing, once said, coming together is a beginning, staying together is progress, working together is success. Now, Philippians is a Bible book all about working together. That's why we've called this series Partnership in the Gospel. It's all about Christians working together so the good news about Jesus can get out to a world that desperately needs to hear that message. You know, often in life, it's not enough to be told to do something. You need to be shown why. Someone has to explain why it's really important. You need more than information, you need motivation. Now, it's something every advertiser knows. So, why buy Calgon? Because washing machines last longer with Calgon. Why use Fairy Liquid? Because you'll have hands that are as soft as your face. 
Why have a Mars a day? Because it helps you work, rest and play. Why use Andrix toilet paper? Because it's soft, strong and very long. See, advertisers know that if they're going to get you to buy their product, they've got to give you a good reason. They've got to give you the motivation. And the other thing that we often need in life is to be shown how to do something. We need practical, down-to-earth instructions, maybe even real-life examples, so we can see it worked out in practice. In fact, they often, often the best way to learn is, is by seeing something, isn't it, when someone shows you. Now, this morning, we're going to be looking at the why and how of unity. And Paul is not only going to be telling us to live in unity, but he's going to be showing us why. He's going to show us the motivation. And Paul is going to give us down-to-earth instructions about how unity works in practice. And he's going to show us an amazing example of those principles in action. So, let's begin. The call to unity. Let's look at verse 1 of chapter 2 of Philippians. Paul says, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in Spirit and of one mind. So this is Paul's exhortation to the Philippians to be one, for there to be real unity in the church. Now notice the verse begins with a therefore, which means you need to look back and, and see what has come just before this verse. So we need to go back to the end of chapter one that we looked at last week. And remember there, Paul had been talking about how they had to stand firm for the gospel in the face of opposition and persecution. That's what those Philippian Christians were, were facing. And so Paul is encouraging them not to be afraid, but to stand for the gospel. In other words, Paul is now saying, look, unity is vital to a church under pressure. He says, in the light of that opposition, therefore, we need to be one. If we're to stand firm in the face of pressure and opposition, we must stand together. Now, we saw last week that Paul has already been using military and sporting allusions in the preceding verses. And it's not hard to see why. You know, armies that are divided are much weaker than those that are united. We said a couple of weeks ago that this town of Philippi was founded by Philip of Macedon, who was the great military leader and father of Alexander the Great. Well, he actually coined the phrase, divide and rule. And it was a very successful strategy for subduing the enemy. If you can get your opponents to distrust one another and, and fight one another, well, they're much easier to defeat and control. And we all know that sporting teams that are united are much stronger than those that are disunited. Between 2005 and 2015, Kevin Peterson was the top run scorer for the England cricket team. However, he was regarded by many of his teammates as a, as a prickly character. And it led to all kinds of squabbles and fallouts in the team. In fact, it became such a problem that the ECB eventually stopped selecting their top batsmen. The team had, had suffered because they were fighting with each other rather than the opposition. If you're a football fan, some of you might remember the infamous fight between David Batty and Graham Lasso. They were both meant to be on the same team, Blackburn Rovers. It was a, a European Champions League match with Spartak Moscow. And just four minutes into the game, Batty and Lasso got into a, a full fist fight. Uh, the two teammates were, were punching one another and, and fighting one another. Well, needless to say, Blackburn went on to lose the game 3-0. You know, the church faces very real and strong enemies. And therefore, Paul says, it is vital that we are not falling out with one another. We're not fighting one another. That we're a united team. And look how all-embracing this unity is to be. So it's to be a oneness of mind, says Paul. A, a like-minded unity. So that we are, we are thinking the same way. It's not an empty-headed unity. 
It, it's a unity that is thought out. It has beliefs and values that underpin it. And it's a unity of heart. He says, the same love. You see, our affections are involved. It's not a, a cold and clinical unity. No, it's, it's when a group of people really care for one another. And then it's a unity of the will. He says, one spirit and purpose. In other words, it's a conscious decision to drive towards the same goals. Now, we've already said it's not enough to be told to do something. So Paul gives us the why and the how. Let's begin, first of all, with, with the why. So first of all, let's think about the foundation of unity. Look again at verse 1. I'll read it again. It says, If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. You see, the foundation of their unity is to be their experience of God. Their unity is to arise out of all that they've come to know of God in their lives. The if here is really a since or because of. So Paul is saying, because you've been encouraged from being united with Christ, you should have unity with one another and encourage each other. Because you've been comf comforted by Christ's love, then you should love one another. Because you have fellowship, or that word koinonia as we said, with the Spirit and we've experienced his tenderness and compassion, then you should have fellowship with one another and you should be tender and compassionate to each other. You see, you reflect your unity with Christ in your unity with each other. You reflect that fellowship with the Spirit in that fellowship with each other. See, if Christ wants to be united to you, with all your failures, with all your personality flaws and weaknesses, then, says Paul, you should be ready to unite with one another despite your flaws and personality traits. What makes you so special, says Paul, that you refuse to do something for others that Christ gives to you? Look, if Christ loves his brothers and sisters, then why won't you, says Paul? And more than that, it's because you've experienced his love, his tenderness and compassion, that you can be all those things to others around you. Paul is saying, let the love that you've experienced flow out to others. You know, a Christian is a pipe, not a tank. A tank holds water but water flows through and out of a pipe. And, and that's how we're to be. Uh, you know, when we experience God's love flowing through us, it's something that should move out to those around us. You know, it's actually true in human relationships that people never, who've never experienced love really find it hard to give love. Those who have never known real love, unconditional, deep love, sometimes have real trouble loving others in that way. That's why it said, hurt people, hurt people. But you know, there's no excuse for a Christian because we have been loved, unconditionally, deeply loved by God in Christ. And that's why Paul keeps using that word, if. He says, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with his spirit, if any tenderness. See, the reason the if is there is because it's meant to be a challenge. Paul is saying, if one is true, your experience of God's love, then the other should also be true, your love to others. And conversely, well, if, if you don't love others, then you've got to ask the question, do you really experience and know the love of God? Or let me put it positively. If you know and experience God's love, 
then you will express that love to others. So our experience of God's love is the foundation or the motivation for us to love others. But thirdly, let's think about the practice of unity. So verse 3, Paul says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interest, but also to the interests of others. You know, they say there is no I in team. Well, while that may be true, there is actually an I, E-Y-E, in team. And the I comes from the teammates that are, are looking out for each other. That's exactly what Paul is encouraging these Christians at Philippi to do. He says, verse 4, each of you should look. Look at others' needs around you. See, the secret of achieving and maintaining unity, says Paul, is simple. Stop thinking about yourselves first. Start thinking of others. You see, we don't achieve unity by not thinking at all. Or by all thinking alike, necessarily. But we achieve it by all thinking of others first. Thinking about ourselves first, you know, comes very, very naturally. It's so easy to be obsessed with ourselves. You know, we, we can ask these kind of questions. What will this do for me? What will I get out of this? What will people think of me? What did they talk to me like that for? Why am I being ignored? What about my rights? Why aren't people listening to me? Why can't I have what I like? Now, when those are the questions that we're always asking, then let me tell you, unity is always under threat. But when we put others first, that is when unity grows and when the church is stronger. You know, I've never heard of a church splitting because everybody wanted to please each other. I've never heard of a church splitting because everybody thought more highly of each other as opinions than they did of their own. I've never heard of a church splitting because people were more bothered about other people's needs than their own. No, it's the opposite, isn't it? It's, it's when we're out to please ourselves, to push our own agendas. We're not bothered about others. We're not listening to others. We're not interested in others' opinions. We want our own way. Well, it's when we're like that, when we're thinking like that, that disunity and division comes in. The two great en enemies of unity, you know, are selfish ambition and pride. Because when you have selfish ambition and pride, you get competition rather than cooperation. You get friction rather than fellowship. And the two great friends of unity are humility and service. You see, it's really, really practical as this, isn't it? D.L. Moody was the most famous evangelist in the 1800s. And people came from all around the world to attend his Bible conferences in Massachusetts. One year, a large group of pastors from Europe were among the attendees. They were given rooms in the dormitory of the Bible school. And as was the custom in Europe, the men put their shoes outside the door of their room, expecting them to be cleaned and polished by servants during the night. Well, of course, there were no servants in the American dorm. But as Moody was walking through the halls and, and praying for his guests, he saw the shoes and he realised what had happened. He mentioned the problem to a few of his students, but none of them offered to help. So without another word, the great evangelist gathered up the shoes, took them back to his room and began to clean and polish each pair. Moody told no one what he had done, but a friend interrupted him in the middle of shining the shoes and helped him finish the task and, and later told the story of what had happened. You see, despite all the, the fame, all the attention that Moody had got, God had enabled him to remain a very humble man. Humility is so important. Becoming genuinely interested in other people and being ready to serve them. So many practical ways that we can, we can work this out, isn't there? Just remembering someone's name can mean a lot. Being a good listener, 
you know, try honestly to, uh, trying honestly to see things from other person's, uh, other people's point of view. You know, when we talk in terms of other people's interests and needs, when we show respect for the other person's opinion, and when we're wrong, well, we're ready to quickly admit it. When we begin with praise and honest appreciation of others, and when we're willing to talk about our own mistakes before criticising others. All of those attitudes demonstrate this humility that the Apostle Paul is talking about here. And then finally, the mindset of unity. So look at verse 5. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Paul's purpose here is to show the, the example of Christ that we should follow. Christ's attitude, his mindset. This was probably a, a hymn or song of the first century church. It may have been written by Paul or he may just be quoting it. But it is wonderful, isn't it? It begins with the heights of heaven. So we've got Jesus before his incarnation, the one who is in very nature God. Here he is in heaven, worshipped and served by the angels, clothed in majesty and glory. And yet he makes this incredible decision. He doesn't hold on to that position. As it says, it wasn't something to be grasped or, or held on to, but rather he lays it aside and so we move on in verse 7 to his incarnation. We're told he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. Jesus said on one occasion, the Son of Man didn't come to be served, but to serve. And so Jesus, who has laid aside his majesty, now serves people. And it says here he's, he's made in human likeness. This is the miracle of the incarnation, isn't it? The Greek word here for, for likeness means outward appearance. And that's in contrast to the Greek word for nature in verse 6, which means essential character. So Jesus doesn't cease to be God. He doesn't cease to be God in his essential character. But he is human in his outward appearance. And then verse 8, Jesus at his crucifixion says there, he humbles himself. And in obedience to the Father, he goes to the cross and, and he dies. And it says, he dies even on a cross. You see, you couldn't get much lower than the cross. It was the ultimate place of shame and humiliation. It was the ultimate place of pain and suffering. And for Jesus, it was the ultimate place of penalty. Because there, he was to bear the penalty for our sins. He was to endure the hell that we deserve. But of course, that's not the end of the story. Verse 9, we have Jesus and his exaltation. So we read, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. The resurrection, the ascension, the, the coronation of Jesus as he's enthroned in heaven, they're all rolled up into this phrase, God exalted him to the highest position. And now every knee will bow to Jesus. Every atheist, every agnostic, everyone, you, me. You know, sometimes preachers say, will you bow the knee to Jesus? But you know, the real question is not will you bow the knee to Jesus, but when will you bow the knee to Jesus? Because we're all going to bow the knee to Jesus one day, either willingly now in, in submission to him or in the final judgment. And all of this shows us this amazing example of, of all that Paul has been saying about humility and, and serving others. See, Jesus is the one who humbles himself. Jesus is the one who serves others. Jesus is the one who gives himself 
sacrificially for others. And that is what we should do for each other. That should be our mindset, our attitude. Sacrificial service for one another. You know, this is worked out in, in many ways, but let me give you one very powerful example. Just a few weeks ago was the 64th anniversary of the death of the five American missionaries who were martyred, taking the gospel to the Aucas. They were a, a South American tribe in the jungles of Ecuador. Nate Saint, Jim Elliott, Roger Yoderan, Peter Fleming and Ed McCulley. Those five young men made the ultimate sacrifice for the salvation of others. They were following the example of, of Christ himself, weren't they? But the story didn't end there because years later, after their deaths, missionaries were able to return and preach the gospel to this tribe. And among those missionaries were Nate Saint's sister, Rachel, and Jim Elliott's widow, Elizabeth. And they lived with the tribe for two years, bringing the, the gospel to them, teaching them God's word. And many in the tribe were converted, including some of those who had carried out the killings years before. And so this group of missionaries taught the Aukas by word and example what it meant to forgive, what it meant to love, what it meant to serve others sacrificially. And in this way, well, the lives of that tribe were transformed forever. Nate's children were also invited into the tribe. And his son, Steve, was actually baptised by the very man who killed his father. Isn't that amazing? You see, sacrificial love overcame hatred and fear. And it brought together two groups of people in a totally miraculous way. See, when we serve one another humbly and sacrificially, well, that leads to an amazing and miraculous unity that only God and his gospel can bring. Well, may God enable us to live with that same mindset that those missionaries showed us. And as we live like this, we will become effective partners in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And people will come to know him for themselves.
Well, we've come to the end of our service once again. Thanks ever so much for joining us. We'll be back next week. As we close, let's say the words of the grace together. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and evermore. Amen.